welcome. Can you hear me all right? No? Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> now it is better. So Mark Nair is a poet and photographer from Singapore. He has published six volumes of poetry and featured in numerous anthologies, both in print and online. A seasoned poetry slammer, he has performed spoken word for over 10 years in more than 10 countries and has represented Singapore in international competitions. He is also a founding member of local spoken word troupe Party Action People. Mark was the 2015 writer in residence at Gardens by the Bay, a former teacher. Mark enjoys teaching creative writing now and photography, classes in schools and institutions. Mark is also a musician who sets his poems to music and to date, he has released two spoken word albums with his band Neon and Wonder. He also collaborates with well-known Singapore musicians such as Bani Haikal, Weish, and Tim Decotta. He is the co-founder and principal photographer of Mackerel, which is a cultural magazine. So, welcome, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> we will first talk about Singapore. Now, obviously, Singapore is a well-known success story in terms of especially uh, its economic uh, situation and uh, development. How much is this due to the late Lee Kuan Yew? Are all of you familiar with Lee Kuan Yew? Have you heard of his name before? Maybe? Yes? No? So... A brief story then, <laughs> if you please. He was the first Prime Minister of Singapore. Um, he took control, in a way, uh, when Singapore became independent in 1965, which is, I think, not very far away from Malta, right? Yeah. And, and his party, the, the People's Action Party, uh, has remained in control ever since. So we've never known uh, to, be, uh, to have a government other than the People's Action Party. And for many Singaporeans, he's equated uh, with the party inextricably equated with the country's success and oh, people refer to him as the founding father of Singapore and uh, you know have this kind of uh, legend uh, he has achieved a legendary status where when he came into power we were a fishing village and he took us from backwater into you know, first world um, metropolis which is not true because we were uh, a thriving port city um, since the, even before the British came, and, and well, we, we were always in a center for enterprise and commerce. And he certainly did a lot of things to the country, for the country, arguably. Uh, and so, as I was telling Anna earlier, the, the range of opinion on him uh, is, is really on a, a spectrum. Uh, uh, from outright disgust and hate to utmost love and adoration. But was he a benevolent dictator? I need to break that down. The word benevolent and the word dictator, you know, it is, it is uh, I think he's benevolent insofar as um, he has literally lifted Singapore uh, up from the morass of Southeast Asia, where if you compare, uh, maybe not so much now, but for the last like 20 years, um, we were far above the equivalent economies in, in Indonesia and Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Thailand. But, uh, so why was he, why, I'm not sure why you use the word benevolent. I think if you use the word malevolent, I might better be able to uh, respond well, he did introduce, uh, you know, welfare programs to no. help with education. Well, we, we are not a welfare state. Uh, we are, in his um, way of thinking, we are a it meritocratic has, It has state. helped people to own their own property, though, doesn't it? Around what? Property. Property. Yeah. Because 90% of the population, it says, own their own accommodation. Yes, but at what cost? Because housing in Singapore is bloody expensive. It is so, now, definitely. But was it always very, very expensive? No, but it's always been... 
It's always been expensive, I think, uh, in relation to, to, to income. Uh, but of course, uh, it's gone up ridiculously. Uh, so, for example, a, a two or three bedroom apartment, and this is public housing, would cost about, it's extreme trade, uh, would cost about 250,000 euro uh, on the open market, a resale flat. And this is not uh, somewhere high end, this is just a regular public, public housing, I repeat. Okay? So, condominiums, private housing is at least a million euro. And you're talking about not very large apartments. Uh, so, yes, we may own our own homes, but we're also paying 40-year mortgages. You know, on, on so them. you're saying that this uh, economic level that is achieved now by Singapore is not quite as successful within the 85% of the population that live in HDB um, properties. These are housing board development. I mean, what we call housing estates in Malta. Yes, we call them housing estates yeah, too. So, uh, so it's not felt by the majority of the population, this, this success, the well, economic the, the, success. The 1% uh, you know, is still very much uh, uh, present, the 1% of people who have and, and are, although I think Singapore is one of the highest percentage of millionaires in the world. Uh, and so is it becoming more and more a land of two extremes? There is certainly a, a growing divide, a growing income divide. Because uh, real wages are not rising uh, fast enough to compensate for the cost of living. And literally, we've seen, um, you know, I, I measure um, cost of living by, by chocolate bars. And, and like I walked into, a, if I walk into 7 Eleven like 10 years ago, I can get a, a Snickers bar for like a dollar, which is a dollar Singapore, which is about 60 euro cents. And, and today it's maybe about easily double or more, maybe two and a half times, so maybe 150 euro or something. Uh, and mind you, these, these snicker bars are, I think, not like originally manufactured in, not, in good Not virgin places. chocolate, no. with all due respect to the no. snicker bar. So, so inflation has come down really hard, but have uh, real wages risen by the same amount in that time? No, no way. Uh, if anything, some industries are, are very stagnant. If anything, at any time there is a difficult year, bonuses are withheld. So it's not easy for, for, for the ordinary person. We end up not having enough disposable income, um, really not enough savings. A lot of people are living off minimum payments and credit cards. A lot more people than the government would like to see and would like to do to kind of reveal the stats. I should say that what Mark has just said is supported by the Economic Intelligence Unit, which has declared Singapore as one of the most expensive cities in the world. Yes, uh, that's also based on housing prices and car prices, because we have a, our cars are ridiculous, because we have something called the COE, the Certificate of Entitlement, which means you pay, 50, I, sorry, I need to keep doing math, like, 30,000 euro, 40,000 euro for a piece of paper that says, okay, now you can go and buy the car. And then you still have to go and buy the car and the car could cost you another But wasn't that euro. also to discourage people from using their own private transport? No, it didn't help. It doesn't, never helped. And if people wanted to buy a car, they would just buy a car and they'll end up uh, taking a larger loan. Uh, of course, if you do the math, it doesn't make sense, but uh, we are also a country of, of, of facades in a way. We, we need to have these... Uh, these markers of, of consumption to, to show that we are uh, progressing. Um, do you think that this expensive lifestyle is affecting the lower income earners to the extent that they are taking it out, they, they are taking this frustration out on foreign workers, and especially foreign workers coming from the Philippines and uh, India and Bangladesh that um, are doing the lower end of the workforce? No, I don't think we take it out per se, you know, we don't have a punching bag room for domestic helpers and throw plates at them. No, 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 we don't do that. Uh, I think... I'm um, glad to hear that. Oh, we have a, an unhealthy uh, dependence on uh, foreign labor, especially from Bangladesh and Myanmar, Philippines. There's a very high percentage of the, of the population, and you're talking about you know, even lower middle income families who, who have domestic helpers, full-time domestic helpers who live with the family. Now, this is something that's quite 
that's been normalized in, in, in Singapore, but it sounds strange in other parts of the world. Uh, and we, we really rely on foreign workers to build our shiny, tall, concrete skyscrapers. We'll be talking about that soon. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> but just a few other things about Singapore. So, although the whole evening is about Singapore, but still, I just wanted to describe a few facts. The fact that there can be uh, the capital punishment given to drug traffickers. There is conscription for males. Wait, drug Singapore. traffickers and, and, and murderers. And, and yeah, and terrorists. And, yes. Oh, no, not yet, but yes. Okay, but you, had, you said you had one and he escaped? No, no, he, he didn't actually do anything. Not in Singapore. He was plotting. Ah. to blow up a train station. Okay. But he escaped. He never went to Malaysia. <laughs> and you don't have a green party. Green party? Yeah. Like an environmental day? <laughs> yes. Yes. That's what I mean. Maybe it's not needed oh, because Singapore is green enough. crap when it comes to and the environment. And uh, we can talk about that later. Yes, we we're going about, to talk yeah. about that soon. So what my, my question is that whether, you know, whether these facts um, show Singapore in a bad light internationally? Uh, well, I'm not sure if you know about our freedom of press status, um, something like 145th or something like that in the world. For a country that prides itself in being number one in many things, they've certainly let that figure slide. Uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech, it's all very, very low. Uh, and th th there's a reason for it, you know, um, uh, the government, in, in some ways, wants to control uh, the kind of discourse that goes on uh, in, in many different spheres. And, and Lee Kuan Yew has sued um, overseas organizations uh, uh, for misrepresenting him. And, and he used to sue uh, opposition politicians. That's why we don't really have opposition, because they, they were, they've been sued until they can't be sued anymore. And you know, they, they die poor or they leave the country. Uh, and, and the, the ruling party does something called gerrymandering. I don't know if you're familiar we with that. We know about that too. Yes. So uh, they, they gerrymander uh, to a ridiculous extent. So, and, and they find all kinds of excuses to carve out new constituencies and bits of, you know, so you're living here and, and there's nowhere that, that the name of that constituency is where you're supposed to vote, but suddenly you're in that region and you're like, how the heck did I come to be there when I have no um, affiliation with that, with that region of Singapore? I'm supposed to be voting for that politician there. And it happens with regularity before every election. Uh, just because they, they, they crunch the numbers and they feel like, oh, maybe this, this segment a bit more, you know, people voting for a bit more for the opposition here. Okay, let's push them into somewhere else where it's oh, you know, pro-government and, and uh, negate that, that possibility. So democracy is still way to go. It, there, there's still a lot to be done in that respect. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the running joke is that we are in a socialist democracy. Okay. And now that you've mentioned him, what is, I mean, Lee Kuan Yew died last year. Yeah. So what is post Lee Kuan Yew Singapore like? Awkward. It's almost as if the leadership um, doesn't have a, a handle on things. He, Lee Kuan Yew was not just a figurehead. So this is the man who was prime minister from 1965 to, oh, I think, 1990. And then he made plans to uh, hand over the succession to his son, Lee Hsien Lung. But Lee Hsien Lung was not old enough. He still had to you know, go through the hoops uh, of government. So he had an interim su successor who was called Go Chok Tong. And Lee Kuan Yew didn't want to leave government, so he created a new position for himself and made himself senior minister. So he was senior minister and Go Chok Tong was prime minister, but guess who was still running the country? Okay, so um, I can't remember exactly when Lee Sin Lung took over. This is really bad of me, but uh, when he did... But is it like South Africa where you had Nelson Mandela being a very charismatic leader and then after he left, you know, and he died, obviously, um, the, the party 
his party is in shambles now, there's a lot of corruption going on. Is it anyway like that? Is it going to anyway end up like that, do you think? Okay, I'll get to that. So just to finish my point, when, when Lee Hsien Loong finally took over, uh, he became the prime minister, Go Chok Tong became the senior minister, and Lee Kuan Yew became the minister mentor. <laughs> so my, my, my so point... He was a backstage prime minister. Yes, and he literally ran a country until the day he went into a hospital, and then a month later or so he passed. And he did claim, Lee Kuan Yew, that if anything wrong happens in his country, he will rise from his graveyard. You know what? I was thinking of a quote, and I pulled that one out. And, and here it is, just because you mentioned it. Even from my sickbed, even if you are going to lower me to the grave and I feel that something is going wrong, I will get up. <laughs> So to answer your question, right, um, since he died, he hasn't gotten up in a year. So I can assume that the country's still okay. <laughs> okay, let's talk about something else now and look at a different kind of rise because it's the high rise now we're going to talk about. Um, Singapore is an architect's playground, it seems. Uh, is it a case, because of all the high rise buildings, is it a case of capitalism on steroids? I'll give you, a, I'll explain my point. So, there is this building being built at the moment, which is going to be the highest one in Singapore as yet. It's called the Tanjong Pagar Center. And it's, it's um, designed by the famous American architect Skidmore. It will be 64 stories high for offices and residential space, and 290 meters in height. According to the developer behind it, Mr. Chang, it is to upgrade, it's for, for companies to upgrade their office. So my question is, how, how much higher do companies need to go to upgrade? That's why I was sort of thinking of high-rise buildings and steroids. You know, that, that center is being built on the site of a old art center, which is a former school, and I used to work there for a couple of years. And, and So I'm really hitting a nerve now. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's a site of great memories. I, I organized a literature festival there. It's more like an art festival. I had outdoor paintings and uh, photographs, outdoor performances, and improv comedy. Um, we ran for a week in 2012, and the next year it was closed down, and, and then they, they tore down the buildings. It was an old school uh, that was built in the 1960s, um, 50s, I think, and before land was being reclaimed. So one day, uh, as I was staying late and preparing for the festival, and um, the caretaker was actually born there, and he used to joke that he's the richest Malay in, in, in Singapore because this is right in the heart of the central business district, the, the CBD, right? And property in the CBD is obviously prime. You have apartments that run into millions of dollars. And, and he has a little uh, house there where he lives. You know, the caretaker is not supposed to live there. He's supposed to just work there as a day job. But he lives there with his mother and his, and his, his children. And he was born in that house. And, and if you know anything about the, 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 the racial demographic of Singapore, the Malays are actually uh, were there from the start, but have never been in the ascendancy when it comes to economic uh, prowess or progress. So, so that, that's a little joke. And he said that he used to climb up to the roof. It's a, it's a modest four-story building. And you could see the, the harbor from, from there. And, and you know, my jaw dropped open because I don't see anything but uh, skyscrapers when I look. And I, I can't see the harbor anymore. The harbor's kind of uh, devolved into some port uh, with big ships and you don't see sailing boats, you don't see the palm trees. And he said something, um, you know, these days even the ghosts now have to sit on top of the lampposts. And, and that really struck me. Uh, and I wrote a poem that, that kind of resonates with that. Uh, but we, we are, I think we are on steroids because we feel that if we don't uh, keep on 
pushing the economy to produce and, and, and keeping that, that, that level of production up, we are going to uh, fall into a recession, a prolonged recession perhaps. And so we have to keep generating uh, jobs, keep generating industry. Okay. Um, but the skyline does get cluttered, doesn't it? With all the high rise. Oh, please. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a way of life. Um, and it's inevitable. It's, it's to the extent that people want to leave. You know, uh, it, you, you don't have a... a it's not just a, a, a skyline. It's, it's, it's lining the sky. You know, and, and yeah. Um, but don't, doesn't it end up all more of the same? I mean, if, if you go to New York or Chicago or, or now Singapore, I mean, for an outsider, all these high buildings end up looking very similar, don't they? I mean, with, with, with a couple of exceptions, I must say, because as I said, it is an architect's playground and there are some iconic architectur architectural places as well, I mean. Yeah, but even the, the iconic buildings are, I mean, what, what, they, what, what, do they, what function do they you know, um, achieve? It's just really to, to show off to visitors, you know, oh, look, look at how, how uh, what an impossible feat of engineering, you know, they pulled off to create this building or that building or this in megapolis or that ultraplex or whatever, you know, all these words that, that, that just sing the praises of the city but don't really, uh, I mean, as a citizen, I don't feel anything for Marina Bay Sands even though it's lauded and applauded and blah, blah, blah. I, I just think it's, it's, it's an eyesore. It's a, it's a giant um, surfboard on top of a couple of sticks. Um, that's how I so see it doesn't it. combine at all with the historic buildings, for instance, such as the Chinese temples and the shop houses, the Art Deco shop houses, which are really quaint and pretty. Well, they try to, they try to integrate it, they, they, they try uh, to, to connect it. And I actually live in the oldest housing estate in Singapore. This is built pre-World War II. I mean, I, we've got nothing on Malta, nothing, okay. Um, so pre-World War II and, and it's uh, walk-up apartments and even then, the shadow of construction is just overhead because uh, just outside the estate, which is very, very small, just a few streets, uh, is a giant 30-story uh, uh, condominium, which is probably the most expensive condominium in Singapore. Uh, is, is being built right now, uh, and it sucks. Okay, so, but most of the high-rise buildings are HDB buildings, aren't they, or not? No, I mean, you, you do have um, uh, HDB buildings that are up to 40 stories now, and that's public housing, but you also have... Um, but what is life like? for the ordinary people in these buildings? I mean, I, I have no idea. I have to ask these questions. Because we live in, in a two-story house, which is nothing compared to 40 stories. Well, for most of my life, I lived in, a, in an apartment block that was 25 stories high, and I was on the 12th floor. Uh, do people interact much? Do, do, is there a community spirit amongst the residents? Is there, I don't know. OK, you in there, OK. Um, <laughs> So in the 1960s, the, the, the government um, uh, created this, this system of, of, well, 60s, 70s, and up to the 80s, where they moved people out from the, the villages, and you call them kampongs, in, in, it's a Malay word, uh, all over Singapore, and even up to the 1980s. And they even moved, they displaced the, the villages from offshore islands and forced them to relocate to the mainland into these um, purpose-built housing estates. And now these housing estates are, are, are rather uh, carbon copy in nature. So one looks much the same as another. They're all very well planned, very well laid out. They have very inspiring names like, like uh, Bishan Avenue 6, Bishan Avenue 7, Bishan Avenue 8, uh, Bishan Street 52, 54. So, you know, very, very practical, pragmatic names. Uh, and at the same time, they created something called the People's Association, which was meant to foster community spirit by creating um, community centers in, in each of these neighborhoods. 
Now, the problem is it's a very top-down thing. And although they created grassroots organizations, still the direction comes from the top and it becomes very, very uh, official, becomes very forced. So, and, and it's always about promulgating the, 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 the narratives that the government wants to, to, to project onto the citizenry and, and the idea of progress, the idea of, of um, uh, we, 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 you know, we were kicked out of Malaysia and so we were making it on our own and we're going there. But it's not, it hasn't really like... So that's worse than a community spirit because it's imposed. It's not something which comes... It's naturally. almost a communist spirit rather than community spirit. Um, and yeah, even, even though um, things are... Uh, it's been 50 years, 51 years this year. Uh, it's still, all the more, it's very static, it's very dry. And because they have this stranglehold, even when people want to do things, they can't. Uh, so you don't really have that, that community space, you don't really have that communal space. Uh, everything has to go through official channels. Okay, um, now let's move on to multiculturalism because uh, Lee Kuan Yew seems to have applied this phenomenon uh, to Singapore's advantage. Um, it is, it seems, it is part of Singapore's success story. But how does it work? And did the way, for example, that the British before Lee Kuan Yew, obviously, um, divide the country into separate ethnic quarters, um, which were tied to specific trades at the time? help this project to work, and then after the war, and hence um, during Lee Kuan Yew's administration, did the fact that most ethnic groups were seeing Japan as a common enemy help kind of unifying the, the, the whole different groups? Because as you say, Singaporeans are actually Chinese, Malay, Indian, Indonesian, but in that order. So the majority are of Chinese descent, aren't they? So, <laughs> it's a loaded question, I'm sorry. <laughs> so How does my, it work? How does multiculturalism work? Let me give you an example. Um, when my parents bought their flat at the end of the 1970s, uh, there was a racial quota and so, when they bought it, uh, they bought it brand new, and they knew that they could only sell to another family of the same race. And by, by the way, I'm mostly Indian, so in case you know, you're thinking, what the heck am I? But I'm mostly Indian, a bit of Chinese. Um, so they could only sell to, to another Indian family, couldn't sell to a Chinese family. And the reason for these quotas is because um, they didn't want enclaves to arise. They didn't want an entire estate to be full of Chinese. And that's, that's how it would create uh, racial tensions, right, when that happens and, and certain areas might become maybe even ghetto areas and things like that. So they try to create, have that balanced, uh, a, a balanced mix of, of different races. And uh, it's still holding true today. Like many, many years later. So, you know, my parents recently told me that they wanted to sell the flat and they couldn't find a buyer. And now it's coming back to bite them because uh, we have become a lot more plural in, uh, as a society. We have taken in a lot more people from, uh, and I'm not talking about like construction worker type of uh, workers because they, they come in on a work permit and they have very limited uh, options. Uh, in fact, there's very draconian laws uh, in place for, for foreign workers, foreign labor. We're talking about foreign talent. So there's this distinction between labor and talent, so to speak. You're talking about your IT specialist from India, you know, or your software en engineer from China. Um, and they are coming in and disrupting the quotas. But this quota still applies to citizens and maybe permanent residents. So there is a certain kind of bias and, and discrimination. And, and to answer your question, I think, uh, no, they didn't follow the British system of, of divide and rule. And I have never heard of the Japanese being used as a unifying factor. It, I think the overall reaction of the Japanese was like, 
See, the thing is, we didn't expect the Japanese to come through Malaysia. Our guns were all pointing out to sea because we thought, hey, these guys are going to come by boat. I was thinking about post-war, post-Second World War, actually, situation when, because obviously the, the Japanese invaded um, Singapore and occupied the country and were not very nice. So that's why I mean that afterwards there was this, this attitude against the Japanese. But of course, this has now I watered think, down. I think, um, no, I don't think we, we, we use the Japanese as a, as a kind of a, as a point of, of uh, bringing the country together. I think we are more concerned about yeah, kicking them out and then after that figuring out, okay, what's going on? Because, I mean, post-war, the British faced a lot of problems in all their colonies trying to uh, come back to rule and people were like, yeah, but you guys, you know, just up and left or you, you didn't even put up a good fight. So, uh, I mean, the Japanese tore through Malaysia on bicycles, you know, and, and completely took the British by surprise and they were just going, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, and running, pedaling backwards through Malaysia uh, and, and all the way back to Singapore and, and they could have won. They could have actually beaten back the Japanese, but it was just very badly, they did a very bad job of, of managing the men and all that. So I think after the war, we were more concerned with, with looking inwards, with, with figuring out um, self-governance. -government, and also we had this whole thing with Malaysia where we, we joined Malaysia for a few years and then uh, they kind of kicked us out. Although the story, that's the official story. The unofficial story is that, that Lee Kuan Yew was a bit too bossy. Uh, so they're like, nah. This guy. But what about culturally? For example, in your magazine, uh, Mackerel, you highlight the cuisine a lot, for example, the, the international cuisine, the multicultural cuisine, um, the fusion and the food. So I guess that is a success, isn't it? Um, so I'm, I would say from the start, I'm not a foodie. Uh, there are people in Singapore who would drive hours just to to eat some, some seafood or crab or something like that in Malaysia. Um, but yes, uh, I think Singapore is known for its food. I mean, the, the Michelin guide recently came to Singapore. So now we have like a few one star, a few two stars, I think one three stars, I think so. See, I'm not a foodie, otherwise I'll be like up there, right? Uh, but we do have a, a, a good history of, of street food, which has uh, not been allowed to remain on the street. So it's been sanitized and moved into uh, like food courts or hawker centers where the, the dynamics of production changes. But we also have a declining hawker culture uh, because uh, young people don't want to spend hours and hours slaving away cooking and, 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 and running a stall where you know, you might make the money. No, you will make the money because you can make money in food if your food is good. But they, it's, it's too much work. So what happens? Uh, their parents who have been running a store for, for 20, 30 years have now got to hire labor, foreign labor. So you get, you get someone from China cooking your, a local dish. Um, will it taste the same? No. Will they put the same kind of love into it? No. Maybe a few drops of extra sweat. Yes. But um, things are changing. I know, I know the, the, the guy that I buy my coffee from in the market, he might not be around in the next five years. He looks about ready to go, but he's still there. So I thank God that he's still there every morning that I can get a really good cup of coffee. And uh, there is an Austrian um, sausage kiosk in the middle of Chinatown. Oh, you read that story? Yes. This is all a mackerel. You should, get, you should check out this website. It's fantastic. It's like the fish, the mackerel, mackerel.life. It's completely free. Um, yes, uh, we, we are probably more, ex well, we have always been accepting of, of all kinds of races and, and I think um, the cosmopolitan nature uh, of food reflects uh, that, that urge to, that, that kind of entrepot trade that we've always had. I would say perhaps we Isn't might... Isn't it a tourist attraction in itself? Yes, yes, yes. People come to Singapore for, for, for the food, to try durian, to try the desserts, to try chicken rice. And I don't know. Yeah. Things that I take for granted, to be honest. Because where I live is a very famous market. And so in two minutes, I can go there and, and have like any number of uh, food that people will travel hours for. So, yes. Uh, food... 
uh, is a marker of identity, I think, uh, especially in Singapore, where we are always um, uh, kind of having all kinds of trouble uh, trying to create or, or identify what makes a Singaporean. I'm not sure whether that is the same for Malta. Well, we have our own issues there, for sure, but uh, it's a different history here, I mean. But the problem with um, facing the kind of foreigner, although foreigners were always around, um, is becoming more of an issue recently, um, because, especially because of the boat migrants, but mm. not just. Let's well, talk well, about... Just a quick yeah. thing about migrants. Well, we, we have a zero to tolerance policy on migrants, so um, I think they're not even allowed to land. We just, just, we don't want to see them at all. So there's, are you saying that, but what about refugees then? No, so. no, don't care. Don't care. The, the, the government, it's not the people. We, we would want to take them in, but the government is, is just like, I, I, you know, it's too much trouble um, for whatever reason and yeah. So Singapore will never share the international sort of responsibility to take in a number of, say, Syrians at the moment? It won't. Oh, please. <laughs> if, if a Syrian chef comes in, <laughs> ah. You did write a poem about Syria, didn't you? About those 10 Syrians? Yes, I, uh, there, was, there was a poem that I wrote about, uh, based on, that, that I read uh, various um, eyewitness accounts and personal accounts of, of refugees in different situations. So I wrote a poem about that for a, a non-profit event where we were raising funds. Yeah. Right, so going back to Lee Kuan Yew, because now we're going to look a little bit <laughs> for a change, but we're going to talk about nature and the environment. And Lee Kuan Yew in his famous book, From the Third World to the First, says, and I quote, Greening raised the morale of people and gave them pride in their surroundings. We taught them to care for, for and not vandalize the trees. We did not differentiate between middle class and working class areas. And so he tried to green Singapore. Did, did this work? Is it true that Singapore is a city in a garden? Or is this all hype and try, you know, tourist attraction, full stop? I don't think people come to Singapore for the trees. <laughs> I really don't, but, but we are a green city. Uh, oh, am I grateful, Lee Kuan Yew, for that? No, no, I'm not, but I think it's a logical thing to do. I would say, yes, it, you would, it seems like a logical thing to do, to, to plant trees, to, to um, reduce, in a way, the, the, the temperature in, in, in a concrete city. And, but when you think about it, when you look at a city like Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok or Manila, Jakarta, that has not happened. For whatever reason, um, these, these uh, cities are burn you up. If you, and, and nobody walks in these cities. Everybody's in a, in a taxi or in a, you know, on a train or something. And, but Singapore, it is and it isn't a walking city. I mean, that's a whole other... Um, but you do have a lot of parks, a lot of um, yes. safari, safaris as well. Sa what safari? So what? Safari, I no, no, I need... I need <laughs> I have to qualify that. No, we don't have safaris. Um, yeah, well, we do have something called the night safari, which is really not a safari. It's a night walk to see, to see some animals that are active at night. <laughs> That's it. Now, on your online magazine, on Mackerel, uh, when you check out the contributor section, it reads, we work with talented individuals who are specialists in their fields and to share our passion for life, respect for authority, and humility before nature. Nature has a capital N. So what is nature, Mark Nair? Is it, just to provoke you a little bit more, a manicured garden? Is that nature? Or is it wild and untouched by humans? You know, this week in the translation workshops, we were, we were translating a poem by, by Joe, Joe Gallia, and, and it's called suspended nature, um, and and I was, talk, I was talking to Roger um, about the title and what is what is the what is nature like? Is it human nature? Is it the natural world? 
I think it refers to both. But you see, I, I attempted to translate that poem into Malay and, and Malay doesn't allow you for the ambiguity. Uh, it doesn't have a word that allows for the ambiguity. So you have to, I have to choose. Um, is it human nature or is it um, you know, the, the natural world? And I, to me, it probably leans towards the natural world. And uh, I would say that's the same answer from Macro, the, the natural world, uh, which is eternally fascinating because there is a measure of the unpredictable you never quite know where, which way a root will go or when, a, when, when something might flower, it would surprise you. Um, but human nature, at least in Singapore, is a lot more mechanized. Would you have preferred to see some of the wildlife to be in Singapore still and not be cleared for building development? Would you have preferred that? Rather than all these beautiful gardens? I mean, they are beautiful, but it's not, you know, the sort of authentic nature, what I would call perhaps authentic nature. I, I, I faced this issue um, last year, like, like you read in the bio, I had a residency in a, in a garden, it's called Gardens by the Bay, which is um, a weird place because it's, it's very manicure, manicured, very, very much landscaped, and they have these things called super trees. And if you Google on, you know, you can Google super tree and this, this strange um, contraptions uh, will arise. Uh, and I was supposed to write an entire book of poetry about, about nature and in response to the, the gardens in, in some way. And I struggled with feeling connected to nature in such a place uh, and where it was clearly a, a jerking off project by the government to show, because it's right, right behind Marina Bay Sands, so it's just part of that whole edifice of, of success, if giant fake trees can be called a success, I mean, sure. So I, I think we, we have repurposed nature for our own needs in Singapore. And, and everything is planned. Even if there's a, a patch of like wild brush of vegetation, you can be sure it's got a indication somewhere in some city planner's report that it's going to be turned into a golf course, it's going to be a mall, uh, it's going to be a car park or, you know, something. It's, nothing is left uh, vacant or silent in Singapore. Does that mean that when you travel and you see things that are more spontaneous or out of the ordinary or out of the norm, out of the sort of rigid, rigidity of, of the thing, it excites you? Yes. I You've chosen your photography and, and your haikus, your photo haikus as well. I'm always looking for space and, and, and a, a difference in, in experience. Um, something that happened when, when I went to, to Eastern Europe was that I was suddenly aware of all this sense of abandonment and, and uh, so many abandoned buildings and I actually stumbled into an abandoned complex. And I could find every conceivable thing in that abandoned complex from, from rusted out cars to, to, to to signages, to magazines, and I was thinking to myself, wow, the only thing I would, you know, that's missing is a kitchen sink. And I found one. I actually found a freaking kitchen sink, you know, somewhere. Like, it was just right there. So, and my life was complete. So, um, I, I think I'm drawn to these spaces that are ironically emptied out and, and bereft of, of habitation, uh, simply because there is an overabundance of this, of, of habitation, in a way, in Singapore. And, and it's not just a place being occupied, but it's how it's occupied. Singapore, as I said, it's so, it's so rigid and everything is... Does it somehow seem more real, more, I don't know... Um, it feels more real to me, uh, um, what, what's lived in Singapore. I mean, if it's, if it's not all, you know, fitted and perfect, as opposed to how it is in Singapore, where it is all designed and... I mean, I would definitely like to see more cracks. I know it sounds weird, you know, we, we try not to have cracks in, in, in society to make sure things function, but you know, when things function too well, you can't help but feel like, like uh, you don't have autonomy, you don't have a say in things. Yeah. That's telling a lot. So, let's talk about you now, as we are actually, but um, recently in an interview you said that Singapore is like a small pond. 
but it's a deep pond. And you said, I really believe there's a lot of potential in the city, and maybe that's why I'm still here. And there's a lot of activity in this pond, because, as we said at the beginning, you teach creative writing, you write poetry, you make music, and together with other colleagues, you have this online culture magazine. Is there a common thread between all these activities? I think it's about experiences and the fact that my brain can't shut up. It keeps going. I, 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 I can't seem to take a break. I'm always, I'm always switched on. Uh, and for the most part, I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong, I do enjoy it. But, and I make no distinction between work and play. Everything, everything is a story. Everything could be a story. Every photograph could turn into something. Every moment could be something. It, it, can, it drives me mad sometimes, but uh, I'm seized by this insatiable urge to experience life in, in whatever form and shape, uh, through conversations, through walking down the street, through, um, like just now, I, I, I walked walk by the harbor and, and I was like aiming for this very classic pose of a fisherman, you know, out there. And then suddenly something out of the periphery, my vision caught my eye, and I looked up and this is, which you know all the time, a giant ass cruise ship just going by, and just filling the frame, you know. So, and I was just, I, I nearly dropped my camera, but, but I, you know, decided to take a little video of that, because I'm sure it's a, it's a daily sight to you, but, you know, it's not every day I, I see that, and the juxtaposition of, obviously, of, of something so ancient, fishing, versus that, that, you know, the cruise ship, and the cruise ship is uh, deliberately large and vulgar, ostentatious almost, not almost, they are, right? And it's like, you know, look at, look at me, look at my big ass, you know, look at, look at how I sail off and fill the horizon. <laughs> and, and it's, yeah, I mean. Did it lend itself to a photo haiku? It will, probably. Maybe a video haiku. Yeah. I've been playing around with that as well. As, like, yeah, any, any moment is a, is a, is a possibility. So can you tell us a bit more about your photo haikus, how they come about, what inspires, what triggers the, the imagination? So this started about four months ago on Instagram. Uh, I decided to do a, a daily haiku, um, which, which is uh, triggered by a photograph. So I would take a photograph and then I would um, write a haiku and place the haiku in the photograph, uh, deliberately conflating the space where you're forced to look at the image and the text together rather than the text below as a caption. And I, well, I started it um, because I, well, I took a picture and thought, hey, you know, this feels like something I could write something to. And then I just, it just continued. And some days I would have nothing and I'll force myself to write something and it became a discipline, it became a writing exercise. Other days I have an abundance of photos. Um, some days I, I'm trawling back uh, through my photos I've taken just to find something that, that I think can work. And all the photos are taken on my phone. Um, and so I like that, that unity where everything's on the phone. Uh, so I, I guess that's also how I use technology and, and social media. So Instagram and I share it to Facebook as well. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about social media being something very debilitating and, and how it could actually damage uh, creativity or, or you know, reduce people to just um, uh, a series of likes, uh, which, which, which does happen, but it's also a very good platform for, for sharing work. Yeah. Although I am being followed by a whole bunch of people who, do I want to be mean? Yeah, okay, they can't write, but then they think they write and they call themselves like, um, blessed angel, the writer, you know, something like that. And then, and then they have like, life is a series of coincidences that will always make you happy when you open your mind. Okay, something like that. And they get 500 likes. And I'm like, how the hell do they do that? But, but yes, okay, so this, <laughs> this what's happening. <laughs> okay, um, now in your latest book, Spominic, you again use photography and poetry. So can you tell us about your experience in the Balkans and how it landed itself to, for you to do this project? Okay, so this is, this is Spominic. Um, it's, uh, it was a trip I did in 2013 uh, through the Balkans, uh, different cities. Um, and I, 
Well, I wanted, I pitched the idea to a publisher. He said, go for it. So I went for the trip, made a book, images and everything, came back, gave it to him, nothing. Silence. Hello? Are you okay? Uh, you know, is everything fine? Are you going to publish? Yeah. Hello? Six months, nothing. One year later, I was like, screw this. I'm going to find another publisher. Um, so, literally, there are two publishers of poetry in Singapore. So, if both of them say no, then I would be, well, it might be an ebook. I don't know. Um, fortunately, the other publisher said, yes, uh, we'll take it on. And, and, and they did. And so, the original publisher to this day has not gotten back to me. And I don't know why. I mean, even if you don't want to publish it, just tell me. You know, there was silence, which is more irritating than a yes or no. So that is uh, the, the publishing journey of the book. But the, the, the idea behind the book is that it's actually more or less led by the photographs. And the photographs connect you to the poems. And, and the photographs and poems are complementary. I'm not intending the poems to be captions on the photos, uh, but they exist they coexist when they also exist independently of each other. I, I have this little thing where I see each poem as a photograph and each photograph as a poem. So in, the, in each photo, you can read things into the image, almost like a, a little narrative. And the poem also uh, contains certain images that, that put you in mind of a photo. Um, so they interact, they, they are interconnected, the, t the yes. two. The, you can't have one without the other sort of thing. In this, in this collection, yes. Oh. Okay, now, I know I was instructed to stick to the discussion only, but I would like for this last part, Mark, to recite a poem. So which one is it going to be? I don't know. All right, let, let me, let me uh, put it to the audience. Um, do you all want to hear a poem from Spomenik or do you want to hear a poem from Singapore? Let's see a show of hands. One Those of, of you, one of, one one of, of each. each. Okay, so you have the luxury of reading too. Okay, so this one is it's called Echoes from the Teke, and it's in a place called Blagash in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it was written when I visited uh, well, a, a monastery. And well, I was also thinking a lot about Rumi. So it starts with a, with a little quote, although Although Tekes are spaces where dervishes praise God and nurture their spiritual side, it's also a place where they talk, read poetry, and drink tea. Echoes from the Teke. The eternal blue turquoise pools of the Vrelobuna are tunnels into which a man could fall, find love, with great leaps from his mind, for the touch of skin on scent, for another hand to trace desire. He hums with trembling memory in empty cafes over the water. Along the skinny path to the river, the fixed taste of honest dirt and unwashed beauty. The man blinks away flashes of the sema, twisting wild into glorious light, as he pauses by the tomb of holy Sari Saltuk, who still spins before pilgrims, their beings lifted to flight as they come to praise. The man looks for a way to undo his knots, remembers that except for fish, everyone is sated with water. A pitcher cannot contain the sea, nor can a man ever fill his soul. Should we read something about Singapore? Uh, Singapore, Singapore. Okay, since uh, this week's uh, translation workshop as well, um, this poem has elements of Malay in it. Um, and the title is Suara. And the thing about Malay as a language is that it's been pushed down, almost repressed, um, from being a, a, a language used, uh, lang language of commerce and markets. And now you hear Mandarin 
uh, more and more. So the title is, is the Malay word for, for voice. Um, yeah, I, it, it, I think the poem's quite self-explanatory. Swara. This was not my mother's tongue, but I have learned you, hesitant, with the fluency of a man who understands a city only through streets he ambulates in routine. So you speak to me in ciphers, in hymns of wishbones and restless soil, in a desire for a different estate. You will always be my foreign lover. I can never know the nuances of your body. All attempts at poetry take me into brick and mortar, wrestled moments of understanding when conversation turns into spitfire and naked jolts of laughter. I fish for hours at estuaries to catch a glimpse of you, listen to your heart beating beneath highways, kiss your lips on reclaimed land. Left to the custom of parades, your words resonate and whisper, bartered through markets and football stadiums under the shadow of our national tongue. Politics, president, parliament. Politique, president, parliament. And the same word is used for voice and vote. Swara. We are alone, singing our anthem in a forgotten language, stumbling like children through these words for progress. Mark Nari, thank you very much for everything. Right, so if some of you have questions for Mark, I've had my say. <laughs> so it's your turn now. Question, question, question. I'm glad you've mentioned Malay because um, officially there are four national languages. Yeah. Did you find the welter of different languages affected your interest in words and the music of words? Well, officially there are four, but in reality English is used most of the time. And it's not, and while there may be announcements at train stations in four languages, it's come to the point where sometimes the announcements only made in English and Mandarin. So there has been a falling off uh, of the national languages. It's not like it's not like in Malta where you know you're multilingual and and like you say you know you you speak to your son in Malta and your husband speaks in English. So we are quite an exception, though. <laughs> it's it 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 kind of symbolizes that that that. That the way we practice our bilingualism yeah. at home, I mean. Yes, and there isn't anything like that in Singapore. If anything, uh, Mandarin is spoken very badly. People from China come here to Singapore and, and they're, they're puzzled. Uh, it's, a, it's a poor uh, patois of, 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 of Mandarin. And there's a lot of, even I can understand most of the Mandarin that's spoken because it's laced with English words and things like that. So there, there really isn't a uh, a strong sense of equal equality am, amongst the languages, and it's weird also because Tamil may not the Tamils may not be the dominant uh, minority group. There's also a lot of Punjabis, a lot of uh, Hindis as well. So uh, it's it's interesting how things have changed after 50 years, but you know these language policies still remain. And at that time, if you worked in Malaya, you had to speak Malay, yes. that was the lingua. Yes, of course. I mean, I think uh, my parents um, communicated a lot in Malay, and the Malay is very fluent in terms of sp spoken language. Uh, and they are in their 60s and up. So I think anyone uh, 50 and over uh, would have a, a good command of, of Malay. But below that, it's, it's really not there anymore. Question. Um, what's the like, role of poetry in Singapore? Um, there seems to be a, a real facade of seriousness and almost repression. Um, at least that's 
I, I got an impression of two sides of Singapore. I saw a really serious side, and then I saw an extremely happy and jubilant side um, in New Year. There were New Year celebrations, and everyone was dancing, and I'm really curious to know how people react to poetry, and what's the role of poetry? Like, what's your experience with that? When you say serious, you mean the, the whole business entity, the I, face of that? I got a sense. I remember being in, the, in a tram, in, in the subway, and everyone had this look of just business-like action, and everything is, goes on like a machine. And I really got that kind of feeling. Um, and then I saw a very different side, but I'm just curious where poetry lies within that. I think we are a very uh, repressed people, in a way, because, yes, we, we have to keep on performing, and, and sometimes, yes, uh, we have this hedonism as well. Uh, I think our abortion rate is pretty high, and the suicide rate as well, you know. But I would say poetry is, is really that fart that comes out. Uh, you, you can't quite uh, allow for it, you can't quite plan for it, but it comes out anyway. And then what happens? People smell it. And there you go. <laughs> I've never said that before. I've never used that, that, that image before, but there, there you go. I think um, poets uh, definitely have a place in Singapore. We try, we, we exist between the crack, so to speak, the cracks, yes. Uh, and, you know, a lot, a lot of poets have, have day jobs. Not many are full-time writers, very, very few. Those who are have rich partners uh, or parents. I think it's true the world over. Um, but you know, and you have diverse jobs as you know, teachers to a colonel in the army to uh, edit magazine editors. But why do we continue to to make poetry? It's it's a way of of writing back. Um, in fact, uh, a friend of mine did an anthology uh, a couple of years back, just before Lee Kuan Yew died, and it's called. It was called Poetry is a Luxury We Cannot Afford. Because that was an exact line that Lee Kuan Yew said in the 1960s, that poetry is a luxury we cannot afford. So my friend, it's a poet, it's like, okay, let's make an anthology about it. So he invited people to contribute and write poems about, about Lee Kuan Yew. And, and, and we did, and it was published. And it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a very alternate uh, perspective of, of life yeah, in Singapore. But yes, it... it it's always existed. Poetry is more developed than prose in Singapore. And my, my theory is that uh, we have such a fast pace of life that novelists can't quite exist. <laughs> it's, it, it's true, it takes a lot of time and space to write a novel, uh, both of which are, uh, you know, it's, it's not, not really found. Are you saying there are less novelists than poets? Yes, yes. I mean, we have uh, maybe a few short story writers, but the ratio is probably about for every two prose writers, you have eight poets, some, something like that, which is uh, quite rare. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you're okay with you. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs>